worship song. Do we have any worshipers in here? Who don't mind lifting your hands? To say that I love you more than ever. I feel that in my spirit right there. Can you say it again? I lift, I lift my hands in total adoration unto you. You reign, you reign on. For you are God, for you are God and God. Because of you, because of you, my cloud. I can sing to you. I can sing to you. I just want to say, Woo! Love you more than it. I feel that one more time. Come on, everybody. Can I get about 10 or 20 of y'all to stand right here? I lift my hands. Lift your hands. Woo! Come on, come on. You reign, you reign, you reign the throne for you are God and God because of you my cloud the days are gone I can sing I can sing to you I just want to say that I love you more than anything come on Say, I love you, Jesus. Yeah, I love I worship it. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Said, I love you, Jesus. I love I worship and adore you. Yeah. I will just want to tell you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Said I love you. I love you. I love you, Jesus. Said I worship, I will just want to tell you, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you more than any. Said I love you, I love you, I love you, Jesus. I worship. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you, Lord, I love you. Come on, come on, everybody. Say, I love you, Jesus. I worship. Just want to tell you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you more. Y'all know this one right here, right? Jesus went to Calvary. Hey, Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's love. That's love. That's love. 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 Jesus went hey, to say come on come on that's love that's love they hung him high yeah. they hung they stretched him wide oh he hung his head for you, you he died. That's love. That's love. That's love. One more time. They hung him high. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung for me. He died. 
That's love. But that's not how the story is. But that's not the story is. Cause in three days, hey, heroes. That's love. That's love. That's not how. Yeah. That's not how the story ends. Cause in three days, that's love. 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 That's not how the story ends. Cause in three days he rose again. That's love. That's love. Sing it one more time. That's not how. That's not how the story ends. He rose. That's not how, that's not how the story ends. Every again. Let's all stand together. Let's all stand. Everybody on your feet. That's love, that's love, that's love. That's love. Last time. That's love. That's love. Come on, clap those hands. Clap those hands. Clap those hands. Clap those hands. Come on, if you love him, clap those hands. You're not tired. You're not tired. You're not tired. Hallelujah. We give you praise, oh God. Hallelujah. Oh, bless your name. And now, God, we, we ask you to have your own way in this house. We're standing between the living and the dead. We can't afford to go back the way we came. We've come too far to give up now. What we need you to do is clear your throat. Speak your mind and have your way. Lead, guide, and direct. We pray, Lord God, that you will speak your word in our hearing. Use this feeble vessel to get you some glory, some honor, and some praise. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the hearers. Now, God, we pray that you will declare your truth to your people. So that your name will be glorified. So that the saints will be edified. And so that the devil will be horrified. In Jesus' name. Remain standing as we turn to the word. We're in the book of Isaiah. And the 40th chapter. Isaiah chapter 40. Amen. Isaiah chapter 40. Amen. Isaiah chapter 40. Just before we read the word, I want to take a brief minute to uh, affirm, amen, the youth and the young adults of the Allegheny East Conference. Y'all know this is home for me. Whenever I get a chance to come, I don't even know that when Ramon called me and asked me, I thought twice. Uh, this was my camp meeting at Northeastern. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that. But I'm just glad to be here home at the Allegheny East Conference. Amen. amen. I want to thank the leader of this tent. Amen. amen. Doctor, Reverend Dr. Ramon Griffith amen. and all these fine cadre of ministers, my former colleagues in ministry here at Allegheny East. 
and Patrick Graham, the youth director, Elder Fordham, amen, Pete Palmer, and Elder Martin, the leadership of the Allegheny East Conference, and my former associate pastor, the Reverend Dr. Jesse Wilson, who's here with us tonight, amen. We thank you tonight. Isaiah chapter 40, very familiar passage. We're looking at verses 28 to 31, Isaiah 40, 28 to 31. Y'all ready for the word of God? Y'all don't sound ready. Y'all ready to hear the word of God? It's too hot for y'all to be quiet. Y'all got to say something. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 40, 28 to 31. Hast thou not known and hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, and there is no searching of his understanding. Am I in the right house here? He giveth power unto the faint, the Bible says, and to them that hath no might, he increases strength. Verse 30, even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. I feel it right here in my spirit. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If you're happy to hear the word, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, I'm going to wait on it. That was the wrong neighbor. That little bougie and sadiddy. Will you turn to somebody else? Give them a high five and say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. I'm going to wait on it. Try it one more time. Give a high five. Say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. I'm going to wait on it. If you receive that, clap your hands right here as you make your way to your seats. I'm going to wait on it. I'm going to wait on it. I'm going to wait on it. I'm looking around the room right now. And aside from the fact that the majority of us are of the darker persuasion I see a number of differences around the room if you will permit me I see some tall people in the room I would say I see some short folk Elder Frazier but I'd like to use the word vertically challenged there are some slim and slender folk. And then there are some folk like me who are struggling with our anatomical proportions. Am I preaching right? A quick review of your 1040 or W2s we review will will declare that there are different tax brackets under the tent as well. In other words, there are varying degrees of poor under this tent. Some of us are upscale poor. And that means what little money you do have is in your house, in your car, or on your back. We got some middle class poor who live with a decent paycheck. But if you miss one, you're going to be broke as a joke. And then where most of us are, you got some pinching pennies, watching every cent, layaway discount and free sample poor. I'm talking about the differences in the room because not only are there varying tax brackets, but there are different professions represented here as well. We've got teachers and lawyers and nurses and engineers, drivers and musicians, civil servants, and God help us, quite a number of pastors as well. 
But as different as all of us are and as varying our tax brackets and professional standing, I'd like to declare that all of us have at least one thing in common. Each and every one of us is acquainted with trouble. I don't have to conduct any interviews to know that trouble, especially in 2019, when we consider who's in the White House, is the great equalizer. Trouble seems to be a part of every human's experience. And the truth be told, I've even discovered with trouble that when you're working hard to escape it, it's working harder to find you. Uh, is there anybody in this house I can get to agree with me that we're facing trouble on different fronts? Let me see if I can call the roll. Some of us are dealing with house trouble. Some of us are dealing with financial trouble. Some of us are dealing with trouble at school. Is there anybody here got some trouble in your relationships? How about trouble at your job? How about trouble in the neighborhood? And I know y'all know this one here. How about trouble at church? When we arrive at Isaiah chapter 40, we find the children of Israel are in trouble. Somebody say trouble. Years of unheeded warning have given way to them tasting the bitter cup of God's corrective and retributive judgment. If time permitted me, I would announce to the people of God today that though the mercy of God endures forever, there is coming a season when the mercy of God will be exhibited as the judgment of God. Ah, because you good Adventists already know that one of the final demonstrations of God's mercy is that he will not allow iniquity to abound eternally. God must mercifully bring to an end the torment that the ungodly have inflicted upon themselves and the world. Exegetical investigation rewarded me with the fact that the first 39 chapters of Isaiah focused primarily on the judgment of God and the utter pointlessness of Israel placing their trust in foreign powers to deliver them. We come to know that the children of Israel have learned the hard lessons about misplaced confidence as they watched their powerful allies crushed by the same enemies that God had empowered to administer judgment to them. The Israelites trusted in military prowess of the Egyptian army. But by the time we arrive at Isaiah chapter 40, the Babylonians have already run up the road and dispatched with the Egyptians. And they've removed Israel's strategic advantage and have left the people of God with no human help. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. Might I suggest, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that there is coming a time in your life where God will remove all the people in your life that you depend on. Can I preach right here? We serve a God who strategically invested in teaching you that your help does not come from any human agents, that true help only comes from God. Might I also suggest that not every enemy is born of demonic perpetration. Some of them are the result of divine invitation. Can I preach right in through here? Some of the hell that you're going through is not of the devil's making, it is of the Lord's permission. God wants to get your attention and we serve a God who's not invested in your comfort as much as he is in your salvation. And if God must disturb and destabilize you in order to get you saved, God will do it. Isaiah chapter 40 reveals God's methodology in how he responds to his people in trouble. I told you they're already in trouble and God brought this trouble. God allowed this trouble. And listen, as a response to the trouble, the people have gone into seeking and supplication. They feared and fasted. They cried and confessed. They hooped and hollered. They wept and wailed. They prayed and petitioned. And here it is. To their dismay, God has not responded in the way or the time frame that they're anticipating. The urgency of their request has not resulted in the exigency of God's response. Is there anybody here that can testify that God has not always responded in the time frame or in the way that you anticipated? 
Have I got anybody under this tent that will confess that at times God's dismay, God's delay in the midst of your dilemma has been the cause of great disappointment? Where are my mature saints uh, who are honest enough to confess uh, that the God you serves uh, seems to be invested in driving you crazy because he does not always act uh, in the way that you anticipate? Can I preach to the church right here? I have found that God's response to many of our situations uh, is not a right away, uh, it's a wait a minute. I know that in this microwave, microprocessor generation with high definition and 4 and 5G, all of y'all want it quick, fast, and in a hurry. But here it is. God is not invested in moving on your schedule. And might I say, preachers in this house, this is my indictment on the modern day pulpit because social pressure and consumer Christianity has caused ministers to preach an incomplete gospel. One that has the matchless potentate of the cosmos, the ruler over time and space, the infinite, immortal, and immutable God is more subject to his people and he is more our servant than our sovereign. I feel like preaching right here. This is a word for all of the preachers who are out here preaching name it and claim it like as if you can command God to do what you want to, when he wants to, and how. Listen, I want, I've got news for you. I'd like to disabuse you of the notion this Sabbath that God will always move with frenzied determination to resolve the inconveniences of your insignificant existence. Pastor Martin, my walk with the Lord has taught me uh, that at times uh, God's response to my request is going to be a resounding wait. Because here it is, your circumstances provides the divine developer of defiant, defeated, and delinquent debutantes the opportunity to maturate under the intense, intentional initiation of inescapable, incomprehensible, and incalculable in irritation. In other words, listen to me. God is going to allow you to go through seasons of intense frustration in order to mature you and to bring out of you the things that he already deposited in you. Our sermonic text causes us and invites us to consider the way in which God responds to our supplication and the handling of our trouble. Because here it is, uh, God's response to the hell that you're going through is not going to be a right now, it's going to be a wait a minute. In other words, relax. Take a deep breath. Because while you're on a time schedule, while you're on a time crunch, God ain't got no watch on his arm. God ain't got no calendar that he's bound to. Because he's sovereign and because he exists outside of time, God reserves the right to come through when he wants, how he wants, why he wants, to work with who he wants. And I, 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 I know some of y'all are frustrated. God does not owe you any explanations. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, this is where human arrogance bump, bumps up against an immutable God. Because here it is, uh, somewhere in your sick and twisted little mind, you think that God is obligated to bow and placate to your desires, to your whims, uh, to your will. And I hear God saying in 2019, I need to teach modern day Israel that I am sovereign God and I'm going to come when I want. I'm going to do it how I want. I'm going to do it with who I want. And I ain't got to tell nobody nothing because if there's anything you ought to know is uh, God is sovereign God. Okay. So I'm trying to build the case that in dealing with God, you're going to have to learn how to wait. You're going to have to learn how to do what? Now, I'm going to be honest, I'm preaching to myself here because I struggle with God's timetable. And have I got anybody in here that's struggling with God's timetable? Let me see if I can call the roll. Some of y'all sisters, amen, y'all been ready for a long time for the Lord to deliver on the boo-boo you've been praying for. And the Lord seems to have delayed 
amen in the blessing am i preaching to anybody in here you ain't got to put your hand up amen but the truth is uh, some of y'all here could testify you've been waiting for mr right and been dealing with mr wrong for a long time and I hear God saying, amen, uh, I might could have blessed you, but if I do, uh, you're jacked up the way you are. And if I gave you a brother, amen, the one you've been praying for, you would mess him up and give him back. I've got to prepare you and to mature you uh, because marriage ain't for children. Y'all ain't talking to me here. Some of y'all brothers, amen, Mrs. Ryder has not come along because you still got a pimp spirit, amen. You still want to talk to every female and you want to be running up on sisters and you don't know how to treat sisters with respect. You're always trying to cop a free hug and a free feel and God says, I'm not going to bless you with Mrs. Wright because you don't know how to treat her yet. Until you have matured to the point where you can be in a relationship with a member of the opposite sex and comport yourself with dignity and you're not ready for a woman y'all ain't preaching to me here some of y'all your finances have not turned around because god knows you're reckless and irresponsible uh, amen your, your 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 credit score looks like an iq score uh, and god says i'm not ready to bless you yet because you don't know how to manage the riches uh, you don't know how to be disciplined and walk past a store and not go in uh, you don't know how to leave the credit card at home and just pay cash uh, you don't know how to be I feel, i'm not preaching to somebody in here today god says i'm not ready to come through because you're not ready yet my response to your trouble and your trial is not a right now it's a wait a minute well if God's response to your trouble is wait a minute listen to me you're gonna have to learn how to wait somebody say learn how to wait look at your neighbor say neighbor God says you're gonna have to learn how to wait all right in the interest of time let me just let me just help you here uh some of y'all it, it's not it's not that you're not waiting it's that you're waiting incorrectly you're waiting fatally and not faithfully fatal waiting says god since you're god go ahead and do what you want and when you're done i'm gonna be right here that's with a negative attitude that's with a careless and reckless disposition. But God is not interested in you waiting fatally. God wants you to wait faithfully. Can I preach right in through here? He wants you to wait, amen, with a good attitude and a proper disposition. He wants you to wait with a spirit of expectancy. In other words, amen, you've got to declare, God, I know your delay is not your denial. I know I'm going to have to wait for a little while, but I believe that when you come through, whatever I was waiting for was worth the wait. Okay, can I, can I help somebody here? So here are the children of Israel waiting on God to come through and God's response is to wait. They that, wait. they that, wait. okay, I'm going to teach you four things about waiting, amen. Four things about waiting. God says if you're going to wait, amen, faithfully, uh, you're going to have to, number one, be comforted by his promises. Be comforted by what? Let me help you, some of you here, too many of you whew, have placed your confidence and your trust in the hand of God and not in the word of God. See, the problem with waiting and, and trusting in God's hand is that when God does not show his hand, your faith goes out the window. But God in 2019 is trying to mature some believers who just put their faith and confidence not in what God does, but what God says. Because if your confidence is what God says, even though it be delayed, you are convinced it will not be denied. When my hope is in the word of God, amen, I may die, amen, not having seen it, but I believe it until I die. Can I help somebody here? Some of the great patriarchs of the Bible never saw accomplished in their lifetime the thing that they believe god to do but as they were going to the grave they declared for god i live and for god i die i feel the spirit of job coming on me the lord giveth and the lord taketh away blessed be the name of the lord is there anybody here that can believe in the promises of god even if you have not seen the hand of god at work so the first thing God says, uh, you've got to be comforted by my promises. Uh, but secondly, uh, you've got to be convinced of my presence. Can I preach right in through here? When you're in trouble, God is not on vacation. When you're in trouble, God is not absent. As a matter of fact, Psalms chapter 46 and verse 1 tells us, God is our refuge and strength. Here it is. 
a very present help. Somebody say present help. All right, if you were tweeting this afternoon, if you were tweeting tonight, you ought to put this on Twitter. Uh, God is eternally present uh, even when he's visibly absent. I can't get no help in here today. Is there anybody here that has the faith to believe that when God does not show up, he's still on the job? When God does not move, he's still on the case. When God does not intervene, he's still working it out. Is there anybody over here on this side that believes that God never leaves us alone? Even when you can't see him, God is there. Somebody say, God is there. So the first thing you ought to do, ladies and gentlemen, is be comforted by his promises. Uh, secondly, you've got to be convinced of his presence. But thirdly, you've got to be conformed to his purpose. Okay. Trouble is always purposeful. Um, I got to be careful with this one because this is not the trouble of your own making. Some of y'all ain't carrying crosses, you're reaping crop. There's a difference between cross and crop. Cross is often what God lays on you. Crop is an issue of you reaping what you sowed. Now some of the trouble in the hell you in, this ain't God, that's you. That was just a dumb move. That was a bad decision. That was you, amen, letting him in when you should have made him use the restroom in the tree down the block. Whatever it is, amen. Uh, somebody here, uh, <laughs> it's not everything that happens in Vegas that stays in Vegas. Because some of the stuff that happened in Vegas is about to turn 10 this week. Y'all ain't talking to me. I'm just talking about bad decisions. That's crap. I'm talking about the trouble that God allows to come your way for the purposes of your maturation. God is allowing you, listen to me, turn to your neighbor and say, God is allowing you a little bit of hell in order to get you to go to heaven. All right, listen to me. It's for a purpose. Because listen to me, some of y'all will never blossom and become what you're supposed to be until you face a little hell in your life. Some of y'all will never discover your propensity for a midnight prayer until you've been through some hell that you can't get yourself out of. Some of y'all will never learn the extent of your worship uh, until you've got something to worship God through. In other words, I'm trying to get you to understand God is working his purpose out in your life. I told you if you're going to wait faithfully, uh, you've got to be comforted by his promises, convinced of his presence, conform to his purpose. But here's the fourth one. This is going to bless you. You've got to be controlled by his power. Can I, can, I, can I help the church? When you're going through hell and you're waiting for God to come through, you need to adjust your attitude accordingly. Some of y'all are so nasty and disrespectful while you're going through hell and high water. We know you're struggling because your attitude sucks. Good morning, happy Sabbath. What's so happy about it? You ain't trying to praise. You ain't trying to worship. You in here this afternoon spectating. Your arms are crossed. You watching to see who's doing what. Why they got to play it like that. Why they got to sing like that. It don't take the devil is a liar. If you're waiting for God to come through, you better check your attitude. Can I preach to somebody here? One of the things you got to learn as you're maturing in faith, as you're waiting on God to come through, your attitude ought to reflect that you're anticipating for God to move in your life. In other words, you got to change it up. You got to switch that thing up. You got to put a smile on your face. And listen, I know it sounds cliche-ish. You're going to have to learn how to fake it till you make it. Because sometimes you don't feel like praising. Sometimes you don't feel like worshiping. Sometimes you don't feel like going to church. But that's the time you ought to get yourself up. You ought to clean yourself up. Brush your teeth. God help us all. Put on some cologne and some deodorant. Fix your face. Pastor, is it a sin to wear makeup? In your case, is a sin not to. Fix your face. Get yourself dialed up. Make your way to the Lord's house. And you better shout. You better holler. You got to say, God, I believe you to do something for me. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to praise you anyway. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to dance anyway. I don't feel like it, but I'm going to holler. Is there anybody in here that's going to be controlled by his power? Oh. 
in the next few minutes that I have left, let me wrap this thing up. Because here it is. The text says, they that, y'all not here. They that, y'all not here. Come on, help me. They that wait. All right, so I talked to you about waiting. One sense of waiting, but let me fix this one here and bless you and then I'm going to take my seat. Can I do that? Yeah. They that wait. They that wait on the Lord. I can't get no help right in through here. That then suggests that in this restaurant called the kingdom, God is the customer and you're the waiter. They that wait on the Lord. Okay, let me see if I can help you here. Any of y'all ever been to a good restaurant? Now one of the things you notice about a good restaurant is that they have good wait staff. If you're eating at a good restaurant, I ain't talking about McDonald's. Come on, huh? I'm talking about Chick-fil-A. I ain't talking about Friendlies and Arby's. Somebody say a good restaurant. You often find the wait staff well dressed, well manicured. And you find them ready and willing to serve. Oh, I'm gonna help somebody here. They have the right attitude and the right disposition. Can I confess? When I've gone to fine restaurants and the wait staff has been of the lighter skin persuasion, I've oftentimes taken the opportunity to express my privilege. <laughs> Can I preach here? I want to see how invested they are in serving me. Because in so many dynamics, I got to serve you. But now that I'm the paying customer, you have got to serve me. Ketchup. Mayonnaise. Hot knife. Tea. I just want to see how committed they are to serving me. Hot towel. Alcohol pad. Hydrogen peroxide. And it is just my, to my pleasure and to my amusement to see them whisk back and forth at my beck and call. And if they're smart about it, even though they're frustrated, they still exude an attitude of service. Okay, let me bring this home. Some of y'all are serving God with a nasty attitude. And I'm here to help you. While you're waiting, you better serve with the right disposition. You may not like every assignment that God gives, but you've got to serve with a spirit of gratitude. You've got to serve with a, with, with a disposition that suggests, God, I'm just happy that out of everybody else that you could have chose, you chose me. Come here, church. Some of y'all think that you are too elevated and too gifted for lowly duty in the kingdom of God. But I want you to know if you are blessed to scrub God's toilet bowl, you're still given an honor that is beyond who you are and what you've done. If God has you in the kitchen, you ought to serve with distinction. If God has you cleaning up the church when everybody's gone, you ought to do it with an attitude that says, I will bless the Lord at all times and is there anybody in here that knows you got to serve with the right attitude your attitude should be where you send I will go what you say I will do God any way you bless me I'll be satisfied okay I'm coming home now listen listen God says you got to serve with a good disposition you got to serve with the right attitude you got to serve with the proper uh, amen uh, uh, with the proper with the proper resolve you've got to serve to all your energies are expended you've got to serve in a sacrificial way 
You've got to give until it hurts. Now here it is. Uh, those of you who've eaten at a fine restaurant, you know that there is a ritual that attends the satisfied customer at the end of the exchange. After you've been served to your heart's content, after you've eaten, amen, to your gluttonous satisfaction, after you've eaten well and the food has been tremendous, amen, a bill is handed to you. Uh, at the first line in the bill, you will find the total. And then, amen, you're going to find those ugly three-letter words, T-A-X, tax, amen. But after the tax, there's another line on the bill. It's called the gratuity. Amen. It's called the tip. Once you've been served and you've been satisfied, you've got to leave a tip. Well, the text tells us they that wait upon the Lord. So when you serve God, God is going to give a tip. Can I preach here? Aren't you glad that God don't tip like some of y'all? Oh, God is generous in his tip, is he not? Well, pastor, how does God tip? I'm so glad you asked. He says, they that wait upon the Lord. Here's the first tip. He shall renew their strength. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, he'll renew your strength. Which means any and everything that you've lost... In the process of your service, God will replace and restore with interest. He says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That means God says, you're going to get some new power. He says, there's going to be a new anointing. There's going to be some new finances. There may be some new power, some new insight. God says, everything you've lost, I'll renew it. Man, I was ready to close the Bible and walk away. Because it is sufficient for me that God is going to restore everything that I lost. But he said then, that's when he messed me up. They shall mount up on wings as the eagles. Oh, preacher, why would God bring eagles into the text. Uh, what is the place of eagles in Isaiah 40 and 31? Uh, I went to National Geographic because I wanted to understand the correlation between my elevation and the eagle. Here's some things I learned about eagles. Number one, if you're looking at an eagle that is not held in captivity, you cannot be possibly looking at an eagle on eye level. You only find eagles in elevated places. So if you're looking at an eagle, it suggests that you're looking up. Here's the revelation. They that wait on the Lord, God will place them in positions where at one time folk had to look down on them. But now folk are going to have to look up at them. You ought to praise God right in through here. Because God says, listen to me. I've reserved elevated places for people who serve with distinction. For places of prominence and position. Amen. Places that are not accessible to others will be accessible to you. I say, oh God, that's beautiful right there. But what else do we find in the eagle? We find, listen to me, that eagles have tremendous eyesight. Eagles are able to see prey from over a mile away. An eagle doesn't just stumble into a situation. An eagle sees a situation coming from afar off. Preacher, what you're trying to say, God says, for those of you who serve with distinction, I will give you insight and I will give you revelation that other people do not have. Have you ever been about to get into a situation and felt an unction from God that it was time to back up? Have you ever connected with somebody and your flesh said yes, but the spirit said no? Have you ever, ladies and gentlemen, about to seal an alliance and felt an uneasiness? I dare say uh, that was the Spirit of God giving you insight that some other folk are not blessed to have. Oh, preacher, what else is it about the eagle that makes the eagle such a beautiful creature? Well, here it is. You never find eagles associating with chickens. Ooh. Can I bless somebody in here? 
We got too many eagle believers associating with chicken friends. Some of y'all have not been very selective in the people you choose to share the anointing that's on your life with. Can I bless somebody in here? When God elevates you to a certain position, you've got to be selective of the anointing and how you expend it. you got to be selective of the relationships that you get into. you got to be selective of the people you choose to associate with. Because here it is, in 2019, I hear God saying, some of y'all have to be more protective of the anointing that's on your life. Okay, I can't stay there too long. Here it is. The other thing we learn about eagles is that their lungs are unusually large. Oh God, why did you give eagles such large lungs? Because at the altitude where eagles fly, the air is very thin. Whew. Other birds attempt it, and because the air is so thin, they're forced to land. But here it is, God makes it so that where other birds fall off is where eagles take off. I can't get no help here. They that serve, they that wait upon the Lord, not only will he renew their strength, but he will cause it to be that where other people fall off is where you're going to take off. Okay, some of y'all don't understand where I'm getting at. All the brothers heard about the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. The wise men were stumped and stupefied. But the Hebrew boys got inside information and the very dream that condemned the Babylonian wise men promoted the Hebrew boys. Come here, church. God says the very thing that will cause others to stumble will be the place where you're elevated. Where other people fall off is where you're going to take off. All right, in the last five minutes, I'll give you this last thing about the eagle and I'm going to my seat. I discovered another thing about eagles. Where eagles fly is where storms develop. That's where storms develop. Contrary winds and atmospheric pressure shifts in those places, bringing about violent storms. Now when eagles see storms, they don't respond to storms like other birds. When other birds see storms, it's an indication for them to land. But when eagles see storms, something totally different begins to happen. For those of you who are not aware, the eagle's wings span seven feet from tip to tip. And an eagle deploying its wings is one of the most majestic things to see. But the eagle does not deploy its wings needlessly. When eagles face storms, one of the first things that the eagle does is that the eagle, listen, deploys its wings. In other words, it shifts. Yeah. Eagles also do this funny thing with their feathers where they adjust their feathers in order to harness the energy of a storm yeah. to propel them above the storm. Yeah. I'm done, church. God says, they that wait upon the Lord not only will they renew their strength, but when trouble comes, they don't run. They shift, they adjust, and they go a little bit higher. See, I can't get no help in here because some of y'all don't understand what this means for your practical situation. That means when your bills are due and your money is low, that's not a trouble you should run from because you're an eagle. You're built for this. You've got to shift, adjust, and go a little bit higher. Y'all still not here. When folk talk about you like a dirty dog, don't run and don't hide. Just shift, adjust, and go a little bit higher. Y'all still not here. When the church committee has met to, to kick you out of your position, don't lose your mind. All you've got to do is shift, adjust, and go a little bit higher. 
you're still not here when your husband walks out on you and picks up your best friend as his new companion don't lose your mind over the one who left you because you're going to need your mind for the one who God's about to send you all you gotta do is shift adjust and go a little bit higher when the executive committee votes your next assignment in Tappahannock, Virginia after you done left Emmanuel Brinklow don't lose your mind just shift adjust and go a little bit higher when the doctor says you are going to die tell the doctor I shall live and I shall not die shift adjust and go a little bit higher yeah when you feel you are about to lose your mind just throw your hands up and shift adjust and go a little bit higher is there anybody in here that feels a full anointing on your life right now shift adjust and go you ought to give God some praise in here you ought to clap your hands in here you ought to spread your hands shift adjust and go a little bit higher yeah that's why the songwriter says I'm pressing on the upward way new heights I'm gaining uh, every day uh, still praying as uh, I onward bound uh, I plant my feet uh, on higher ground uh, can I get about 50 uh, or 100 of you right here uh, stand up on your feet right now uh, and say yeah say yeah say yeah Shift, adjust, and go a little higher. Look at your neighbor, say, neighbor, oh neighbor, shift, adjust, and go a little bit. Clap those hands, clap those hands. You're standing on your feet now. You're on your feet already. This trouble you're in, it ain't meant to kill you. It's meant to reveal how much of an eagle you are. Don't lose your mind now. Shift adjust and go a little bit higher pastor what's the guarantee that we're going to make it they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint that's why I'm going to wait on it because I know it's delayed but it's not denied I don't mind waiting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Though he slay me, yeah, 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 yeah. yet will I trust in him. Yeah. Write the vision. Yeah, make, it make it plain. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That they may run. Yeah. Though the vision is only for a while, it shall speak and not lie. Because if the Lord said it, you can count on it. God will do just what he said. Who believes the word of God this afternoon? We're closing our service. And in 2019, this is the declaration that I've made to the Lord. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind waiting. I don't mind away hey, on the Lord. Hey, 
I don't mind away. Hey, I don't mind away. Hey, I don't mind way. Hey, hey. Oh, I'm the Lord. Look at your neighbor and minister that song to them. I don't mind away. I don't mind away. I don't mind away. On the Lord. Come on, minister that song to your neighbor. I don't mind away. Said I don't mind. I don't mind. Preachers, come. Oh, preachers, on the rock, on the stage. I don't mind away. I don't mind. Away. Spread out. Call, my oh, man. I don't mind away. On the spread it out. Said I don't mind. I don't mind away. I don't mind away. Hey, day. I don't mind. I don't mind. Hey, day. On the Lord. On the Lord. Shh. Listen. There's somebody under the sound of my voice. Eyes are closed and heads are bowed. You've been waiting for God to come through and you've been frustrated in your waiting. But the word has, the word has been spoken in your hearing today. And you want to declare right here and right now, God, I don't mind waiting. Because whatever it is that I'm waiting for, it's worth the wait. You may not come when I want to, but I know you're going to be right on time. Somebody here, you're waiting for God to do something. You're waiting for some door to open. Financial door, emotional door, psychological door, relational door. You're waiting for a job opportunity, a relationship to turn around. You've been frustrated because God has not done what you wanted and when you wanted and how you wanted but you're going to declare, God, I'm going to wait on you. And I'm not waiting fatally, I'm waiting faithfully. If that's you this afternoon, I dare you right here, right now, slip out into the aisle. Make your way down to this altar. Tell God, God, I'm not giving up on it yet. I'm not giving up on my miracle. I'm not giving up on my blessing. I believe that you will do just what you said. And I'm going to wait faithfully. I don't mind. I don't mind away. Where are you? Come close. Fill up this whole area. Preachers, move up. Come close. I don't mind. Oh, come in here. Home the Lord. Said I don't mind. I don't mind. Said I don't mind. Waiting. I don't mind. On the Lord. Now here it is. Praying and asking God to do something for you. Ain't nothing wrong with that. As long as you're open to the fact that God may not do what you're praying about. Because more than getting what you want from God, you need God to get what he wants from you. <laughs> Listen, and sometimes that means God will not give you what you ask for. But he sure enough will give you what you need. I've watched God open doors for me that I didn't even pray for. As a matter of fact, I prayed for the door right next to that door to open. And God was like, no, 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 that's not the one. You don't understand what she was asking for. But the good news for you is that I don't just read your mouth. I read your heart. I know what you need more than what you want. And so I may not give it to you here and now. I may not give it to you the way that you want it. But if you wait on me. I'll renew it for you. Then I'll take you up into elevated positions. I'll let you see things that other folk didn't see. I'll sustain you at high altitudes where the air is thin. But more than that, when storms come your way, it's not going to kill you. You just shift, adjust, and go a little bit higher. Can I confess something to the church this afternoon? Can I confess something to you? I am living right now through one of the worst seasons of my life. I told one of my friends what I was going through. He said, and you're able to preach like that while you're going through that? I understand grace in a totally different way. 
Because it ain't because I'm so faithful that God bless me. It ain't because my devotional life is so out of control, next level. It ain't because I'm praying 20 hours a day. It's the grace of God. And I've been asking God to switch this thing around. And as yet, he has not chosen to act. But that has not altered my determination to serve. I said, God, if I'm going to die, I'm going to preach. I'm going to die in the pulpit. I'm going to die giving you all the praise that I got. I'm going to die with hell breaking out in my life. Because I'm not going to be a liar. When I tell God I will bless you at all times, I mean that. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what hell I'm in, no matter how much the devil got his clutches on my neck, I don't mind waiting on the Lord. Is there anybody in here this afternoon that wants to join these at the altar and tell God, I don't mind waiting on you. God, I'm stressed out. God, I'm angry. God, I'm frustrated. God, I'm tired. God, it seems like you've disappointed me. God, I want to turn in my ordination credentials. I want to turn in my commission certificate. But God, I'm going to keep on going because they that wait upon the Lord. Where are you this afternoon? Come to the altar very quickly. Somebody else here while we're closing. There's a baptism this afternoon. And for you, this is a golden opportunity to cement your relationship with Jesus. Get back on track. Maybe you have not yet decided to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. But you want to tell God, God, I trust you with all my trouble. And I want to follow Jesus all the way. If that's you this afternoon, when this service is over, connect with one of the pastors and one of the leaders here. Tell them, I need to be baptized today. I can't wait no longer. I need to get my, my situation right with the Lord. Grab the hand of the person you're standing closest to. Don't mind waiting on the Lord, yes. I don't mind away hating on the Lord. Yes, I don't mind away hating on the Lord. Preacher, stretch your hand out over the congregation as well. Bow your heads. Father God, in the name of Jesus. You got some folk here who are in a difficult season of waiting. God, trouble has afflicted all of us in some way, some shape, in some form. God, it's stressful to be up underneath this tent here today with all the hell we got going on in our lives. And some of us just came, God, to just get away, take a breath, to get out of D.C., to get out of Maryland, to get away from Delaware and New Jersey, to just slip out from underneath our trouble and come to a place of wholeness and healing. And we're so glad to know, Lord God, that if we wait on you, if we serve you, you're going to make the waiting worth the while. You said you're going to cause us to shift, adjust, and go a little bit higher. God, we're believing you to work some things out. Lord, we're believing you to work some things out right now. We know you're able to do that. Some blessings are instantaneous. And where you see fit to do that, God, we receive that right now. And for the blessings that are a little bit more progressive, for the ones that take a little longer to work out, for the family dynamics, oh God, that do not turn around immediately, God, we trust you for those as well. We're believing in your promise and we're going to wait on you, Jesus. And while we're waiting, God, we're going to wait with a good attitude. We're going to wait with the right disposition. We're going to wait with hands raised and voices lifted, declaring the praises of our awesome God. Thank you for this service. Thank you for this word. We receive it now, God. And for the ones, oh God, who are considering making that life-altering decision to be baptized and to go with you all the way, we pray that you will solidify that choice today. Bless them as they go to the watery grave of baptism to unite with Jesus Christ for time and for eternity. We play this blessing now, blessing now in the name of Jesus the Christ. Let the people of God say amen, amen. and say it again and say it again. Will you clap your hands right here?